My name is Chapel Roan. I'm your favorite artist, favorite artist. I'm your dream girl's dream girl. And I'm gonna serve exactly what you are. Chapel Roan has had a breakout year going from an indie artist to hitting the mainstream. She released her debut album, The Rise and Fall of a Midwest Princess, last year, but it's just now starting to chart this spring and summer, becoming a sleeper hit. She's been a huge draw at music festivals and is being grouped with two other successful female artists that have released commercially successful music this year, Sabrina Carpenter and Charlie XCX. Spawning dozens of think pieces about how fun, frivolous, flirty pop is back in the mainstream. But where did it all start? I've heard whisperings of Chapel Roan and her song Pink Pony Club for years, but I didn't know her story and where she came from. So I decided to do a deep dive on Chapel Roan, watching numerous interviews, reading dozens of articles, and scrolling through her old social media to find out how her story began. So come along with me, grab a snack, and enjoy as we dive into the rise of a Midwest princess, Chapel Roan. I'm just having fun on the stage in my heels. Going back to the beginning, Kaylee Rose Amstutz was born February 19, 1998 in Willard, Missouri. She's the eldest of four children, and her mother is a veterinarian while her father works in healthcare. No one in her family is musical, but she began taking piano lessons when she was around 10 or 11. And for her eighth grade talent show, she decided she wanted to participate and perform a song on the piano. This was her first time singing publicly, and she had low expectations for the performance, but she ended up winning the competition with her rendition of the Christmas song. She recalls the positive reaction from her performance saying, people were like, wow, you have a great voice. And I told them I really had no idea. I wasn't in choir. I was in one year of choir my whole career of school and some musical theater, but I had just started. After the positive feedback from her talent show performance, she began looking for other avenues to showcase her singing. In the summer of 2012, she won Springfield's Got Talent, covering True Colors by Cindy Lauper at age 14. After she won the competition, she would be asked what her musical goals for the future were, and she would say her goal was to win a Grammy, which, like, it's happening. It's happening next year, right? I want to win a Grammy, so that's my goal, and I'm do whatever it takes to get it. She would also audition for America's Got Talent and The Voice, but would be rejected from both. Undeterred, Kaylee would start writing her own music, and she was inspired to write music after attending a summer camp. She would reflect back on this in 2023, saying, I've never met creative kids before that camp, and it changed my trajectory forever. I'd never been with other songwriters before in my life that were my age. And I'm from Trump country. I'm from a heavily church background. And this is not that. There were kids all over the world there. It was just so inspiring. And while at summer camp, she would write the song, Die Young, which she would later record independently and release with three other songs, Crave You, Tell Me Again, and I Don't Love You. And these songs would be available online in October and November of 2014. Die Young would be about feeling depressed and unloved, but convincing herself that life is worth living and she still has experiences she wants to have. You say you wanna die young, wanna die young. Crave You is about falling for someone and hoping that they'll treat her well. I know you hear me. I love is bittersweet. I crave you. Tell Me Again is a song where she's deeply invested in a relationship, but the person she's with is toxic and lying. Tell me again how this is love. Gave me that, I gave you all. 
and I Don't Love You is about someone expressing romantic interest in her, but she doesn't reciprocate their feelings. And I don't love you But I know you love me Around this time, she began posting to YouTube and post the original song, Die Young, which started to get a lot of attention. In particular, the Australian YouTuber and singer, Troy Savon, would shout out her YouTube channel on Twitter multiple times in her early career. And on her old Instagram, she would thank him for driving traffic to her video. Her old Instagram's still up. I wonder if she forgot the password. After an original songs started to garner attention, she was signed with Atlantic Record Company May 8th of 2015, during the end of her junior year of high school. Kaylee would take this stage name Chapel Roan after her grandfather, whose name was Chapel, and his favorite song was The Strawberry Roan. Chapel wanted to honor him because he was always very proud and supportive of her, but unfortunately, he would pass away before any of her music was released publicly. She would say, I let him hear rough demos, and I told him I was going to be Chapel in his honor. Chapel getting signed to a record label was a whirlwind. She would say, it happened so fast and I just wasn't ready. It's so cliche, but one weekend I was playing at coffee shops and the next weekend I was signed to Atlantic Records. It was very, very unhinged and really scary. I just genuinely didn't know what I was doing and I didn't feel like I had a lot of help. Her first single she would put out with Atlantic Records is Good Hurt, which would be featured on Spotify's playlist Weekly Buzz. The song and her graphics and branding were very dark and moody and sultry and kind of witchy gothic vibes. She would explain the meaning behind the song on Genius saying, At the time, I was dating a really boring guy. There wasn't much going on in our relationship. Unlike my previous relationship, I wanted that toxicity and pain my previous relationship brought me. Because that's all I knew. It was very unhealthy. So that's what I wrote about, wanting that good hurt. After releasing her first single in August, she would release her first EP in September called School Nights. School Nights would feature Die Young, Good Hurt, Mean Time, Sugar High, and Bad For You. About Dai Young, she would say, I wrote that song when I was 16, and I was going through a tough time with my parents, making friends, with myself, really. So that song was kind of like multiple stories and problems into one song. Meantime would be about having uncertain thoughts about her life and relationship, but hoping that she can be with them in the meantime while she figures it out. And I keep my doubts in the back of my mind, and I still love you in the Cut me slack while I figure it out and I'll still love you in the meantime. And in Sugar High, she would sing about savoring a delicious romance that's leaving her with a sweet euphoric high. Candy man, you are mine. You know how you get me, give me sugar high. And in Bad For You, she would sing a seductive, moody love song. She explained the reason behind naming the EP School Nights, saying, I thought School Nights sounded interesting. It makes me feel young. I wrote all these songs when I was younger. I wanted to bring it back to that place. Around this time, Chapel would become a local celebrity around Willard and Springfield and be featured in a few publications there. They would often say she took inspiration from Sia and Lana Del Rey, and they would market her as the next Lord. I don't know. I just, like, don't picture myself as the next lord like I am just chapel Roan. Yeah. and I like I get the comparison like it's I'm very grateful for it why lord just because she has dark curly hair girl so confusing she would open for Vance Joy's lay it on me tour in late 2017 and after performing on the tour she would say I'm exhausted I'm kind of still recovering I'd never performed in front of more than 300 people and there were like 1700 set venues I was so nervous and then in early 2018, she would be joining British singer Declan McKenna on his North American tour for two months. 
In February 2018, she would release the song Bitter, where she sings about how her experiences have made her bitter, but she's better that way. She'd be very thankful for Vance Joy and Declan McKenna's fan bases for being supportive and accepting of her. In Denver, someone was like, oh my god, like, Chapo! <laughs> I was like, how do you know who I am? Like, I was just like, like, as I was walking out on stage, they were like screaming for me, and that had never happened before. And so, and plus it was a great crowd, it was a great night. In early 2018, she would also post on social media about her progress for her first album, saying, I've been working on the album, and it can be a bit draining at times. I wrote most of these a few years ago when I was in a very dark place, and now I'm nowhere close to that person. It pulls me right back to where I used to be. Sometimes the world feels so lonely and sad, but through this process of writing and cultivating my project, I've learned that pain is temporary. You won't feel this way forever. I hope that when you hear it, it will help you through your pain as it did mine. I don't know when it's coming out, but I'm taking time to make sure everything is perfect. And in interviews, she would also describe the album as being all about one relationship, one person. The first time I fell in love and the first time my heart broke. It was my journey and how I recovered. The EP takes a few songs about it off of the album. After touring as an opener, she would come back to Springfield and give an interview there saying, I was gone five months and I just got back two or three weeks ago. Just since I've been home, I've written three songs. That's unheard of. Being home has like an extreme nostalgia. It's like time hasn't passed here because in LA, in the whole world, and on the coast and stuff, everything moves so fast. Here, nothing changes. I come home and I feel like I'm in high school again. I don't know what it is. I literally wake up and I'm like, oh, do I have track practice today? But I've been out of high school for three years because the music industry is so far removed from here. The average set list for her shows around this time would be Die Young, Bad For You, Bitter, Mean Time, Sugar High, Lavish, an unreleased song, Good Hurt, and School Nights, School Nights is another single she'd release May 15th, 2018, sharing the same name as her EP. She would describe this song as a temporary feeling of staying up late on a school night and talking on the phone with someone you like when you really should be asleep. The feeling of being young and feeling things for the first time. You wanna win me over now Impress me like a school fight And that triple dog day the pinky promise that you'll never lie. Around Christmas 2018, she would perform Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas on a local news station. She is from Willard. She makes her home in L.A. now, but she's back in the Ozarks for the holidays. It's Chapel Rowan. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. After this performance, she would take a break from the public eye and social media for almost a year. Until December of 2019, she would return to social media with a heartfelt post. Hi, I've been gone for a while because I needed time to gather myself so I could create things I love. I have anxiety about posting slash being on social media. Thank you for being understanding and being here with me every step of the way. I want to show you how I got here and who I am. Being genuine matters to me. I want to be myself with you. You can be yourself with me too. I will love you anyway. Love Chapel. In early 2020, she would begin posting covers to her YouTube channel. Even though she had a small fan base at the time, they were very supportive and excited to hear about her new music. After getting a record deal, Chapel would move to LA and this would be a big culture shock for her. She would explain her complex relationship with Missouri in the Midwest. I'm from the Bible Belt. There's a lot of churches. There's a lot of straight people with families and it's just really encouraged to take on the role of wife and mother. There's this mentality that a woman should be treated like a princess, but also she should be a cook, a cleaner, a driver, and so on. I never fit into that mold. I tried. I really, really tried. I thought I was going to get married right out of high school at 18 or 19, and I thought I was going to have a baby by 23. I tried to fit myself into that mold, and it didn't work. It left me with a really interesting relationship with the Midwest. 
The Midwest remains a big part of who I am, and I do love certain parts of it. The peace and growing up in a trailer park, four-wheeling, the farm, and bonfires. I love it even more now because I can reflect on it and be like, oh my god, this is so camp. I am very grateful now, looking back, that I am from such a conservative Christian background because I understand the communities there and I understand where they're coming from. It's very easy to label communities you don't understand and because I know the inner working of it, I don't see it as anything it's not. In early 2020, she would start teasing a new single, Pink Pony Club, written and produced with Dan Nigro, who she would start working with in 2018. This would be Chapel's first song written outside of high school and centering around her new life living in LA. She would explain the juxtaposition between her new single and her past music now that I moved to LA and started my life on my own, it feels like the next level. It's like a new part of myself burst open once I started struggling in such a large city and started crawling around trying to find out who I am. It's brought a lot of new content. She'd get inspiration to write Pink Pony Club after visiting a gay bar, The Abbey, in West Hollywood for the first time. She would say, I went to a gay bar called The Abbey in West Hollywood and was completely changed by the entire experience. I was enthralled by the go-go dancers, and I thought about how amazing it would be to be one. So I wrote a song about it. The pink pony part was inspired by a strip club that was painted hot pink in my hometown. In this song, she would sing about someone moving from Tennessee to West Hollywood to become a club dancer and living their dreams despite their mother's disapproval. And the music video would be filled with drag queens. When releasing the song, she would write a statement saying, I'm tearing up as I write this. The last time I felt this kind of joy, I was standing in front of you singing on tour. I am so proud of this song and video. It was so scary for me to write because it was so different. I am so thankful that you waited and believed in me through years of mostly silence. You're amazing and you're the reason this is out. Thank you for inspiring me to keep my creativity alive even when things seem hopeless. I love you. Thank you Dan Nigro for writing this with me and believing in this crazy concept, constantly pushing me to be a better writer, putting not one but two guitar solos in the song and producing it to perfection. Despite the song feeling like a creative breakthrough for Chapel and Dan, there would be a lot of pushback from their label and they would have to shelve this song for over a year because their label didn't want to put it out. It seems like they were fearful of Chapel losing her current fan base and they weren't excited about the new direction she was going in. And for a while, Chapel thought that they were right and maybe her new music wasn't a good choice. But this song would have longevity. In 2021, it would even be considered to be the song of the summer by Variety. This is my song, Pink Pony Club. It released almost two years ago. <laughs> And it is spread by word of mouth and is finally on Lorem, which is one of my favorite Spotify playlists. And it would end up charting this summer for the first time over four years after its release. Soon she would begin posting covers and song promotions on TikTok as well. So this is love. Mm -hmm. So this is love. Are you gay? Do you like clubs? <laughs> then I think you would like my song. Actually, no, you would love my song, Pink Pony Club, if you're gay and you like clubs. In May of 2020, she would release another single, Love Me Anyway, about the enduring love between two people. This song would also be co-written and produced by Dan Nigro. You still love me anyway. 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 When releasing this song, she would say, I'm so happy to see this out in the world. It has been with me for a long time now. And every time I listen to it, I feel all sparkly and warm, like I'm at summer camp or getting ready to go to a dance. I made most of these crafts during the release of Pink Pony Club. So I was freaking out about both songs at the same time. Haha. <laughs> it took me three weeks of planning and crafting. My roommates kindly helped too, but it kept me busy during quarantine. I hope you like it. This song would be released with a beautiful Love Me Anyway lyric video made with paper crafts. This video would also introduce her audience to her guinea pigs. She would say in a post, I adopted them from LA Guinea Pig Rescue in 2018 because I thought having a guinea pig would remind me of home since I had one I adored in fourth grade. I did not ever think I would have four, but here we are. It brings me so much joy taking care of them, especially in quarantine. They make me laugh every single day, 
because they're such tiny animals with big personalities. They're deaf not easy, low maintenance pets whatsoever, but I love them and they're precious to me. Sonic Tricolored, Honeydew Black, Go Go Gray, Nadine Long Hair. P.S. Please consider adopting rather than buying at pet stores and support local shelters. God, what have you done? You're a pink pony girl and you dance at the club, oh mama. I'm just having fun on the stage in my heels. And by the end of May, she'd release another single, California, a song that beautifully parallels Pink Pony Club, singing about moving to California to chase the dream. But in this song, Chapel is dealing with the pressure and failure of not succeeding her dreams and feeling like maybe she should move back to her hometown where she belongs. I miss the seasons in Missouri, my dying town. Thought I'd be cool in California, I'd make you proud. Do think I almost had it going, but I let you down. When releasing the song, she would say, I am so incredibly homesick right now, and this song matches how I'm feeling perfectly. I questioned everything I knew the second I moved to California. It was terrifying because I felt very lost and alone. Although it was scary, I grew into a person I now love. I'm still struggling with feeling out of place and making friends in Los Angeles, but releasing music and knowing that I can help someone with my songs proves to me that I must keep pushing forward. I'm so grateful to Dan Nigro for helping me write and finish this song and for pushing me to try something new with the production. I absolutely adore it. I hope you like it, and I'm so happy it's out after three years of struggling with this song. It's finally here. Much love to you in this very hard time. In August of 2020, Chapel would be dropped from Atlantic Records. Around this time, she would also break up with her boyfriend of four years and move back to Missouri with her parents to work at a drive through coffee kiosk. Eventually, after saving money, Chapel was able to move back to L.A. She worked as a nanny, a production assistant on an HBO show, and a cashier at an emo-themed donut shop. Unfortunately, COVID would delay her success because I think songs like Pink Pony Club are made to be sung on stage with a crowd. In January, she would write on Instagram, I'm not going to stop photoshopping myself into stupid backgrounds until West Hollywood opens back up. I want to hear drunk people screaming Pink Pony Club, so get used to it. During this time in early 2021, Dan Nigro would release another song with another artist that he's working with, Olivia Rodrigo, and Olivia Rodrigo's debut song, Driver's License, would become a number one hit. Whoa, I have a whole video about that. And during 2021, Dan Nigro would mainly focus on working with Olivia Rodrigo on her debut album, Sour. Chapel tried to find other producers to work with, but felt like her and Dan worked best together. And she would later say that it was his biggest year ever, and she didn't want to get in the way of that. Um, and huge thanks to Dan, who made all of my music with me. Dan, you are the best friend, collaborator, person I could, you know, ever ask for. So uh, this is uh, all because of you, so thank you. So she took a step back to let Olivia and Dan have the spotlight. Both Chapel and Dan were confident about the project that she was working on and wanted to continue working together. She would continue posting on TikTok in 2021. In an interview, she would say, TikTok was just a way to display my personality and the inner workings. But it felt like hell most of the time, trying to get it together as an independent artist and also having a part-time job. In December of 2021, she would post a snippet on TikTok of a song she was writing. This song is gay. It's about being in love with a girl, but you can't because her parents want her to be in love with a man. <laughs> so you have to break up or else her parents will like disown her. If I say goodbye, it's only because I can't compare to a boy your mother loves, but I'll try. Dress up real nice. I'll end up cheering for all the teams your father likes. And of course, I know you love me. Only be yours temporarily. Cause I'll never be. In this unreleased song, Chapel would sing about wanting to be with a girl whose parents don't approve of their relationship. And Chapel would start to be more open about her sexuality on social media and in her music. 
And in 2022, Chapel would become a true independent DIY queen. She would get a publishing deal with Sony in March of 2022 and start releasing music again. Her first comeback song would be Naked in Manhattan, co-written with Dan Nigro in Skylar Stone Street. And this would be a sapphic love song about her visiting her friend in New York. And it's a coming of age song singing about their past experiences and their past friendship and how they've both always had a crush on each other, but they've never made a move. And this song would also deal with Chapel's internalized homophobia. She would say later about this song, I was dating a boy then. I'd never even kissed a girl when these songs were written. It was all I wished my life could be. It was very apparent that I was not supposed to be dating this guy, but I was so scared to go there with a woman that I wrote songs about it instead. And later, when talking about her sexuality in 2023, she would say, I saw what would happen to me if I came out and I knew that it would be a sin at the time. And I think that to grow into the queer girl that I am today, I obviously had to stop dating men who were not it. I had to stop settling for losers and start dating women and getting rid of the shame. I have a girlfriend now and I struggle with it still, but it's taken baby steps to get to the more confident drag queen version of myself. So through the persona of Chapel Roan, she was able to be a character that was very open and expressive about her sexuality something that Chapel wasn't ready to do in her own personal life. When releasing this song, she would write on Instagram, after three years of working on it, she's finally here. I'm so proud of it. I want people to get naked, party their asses off, do drag and strip routines, drive with the windows down, make out, scream and dance, all of it while listening. Thank you, Skylar Stone Street and Dan Nigro for helping me bring this to life and believing in me. It's everything I wanted and more. I've always looked up to both of you as creators and human beings, and I can't wait to make more with you. Thank you, Ryan Lee Clemens, for creating this visual world with me, shooting the cover and music video, and being such an amazing friend. I love you so much, and I'm so excited for the next one. Let's go, bitch. And when discussing the music video that they shot in New York, she would say, We had no plan, and we just ran around New York shooting me in a bunch of different outfits that I thrifted. It was just so fun and freeing. It was the first time I was like, oh, I think this is what it should feel like. I learned how to do drag makeup and how to bedazzle and sew a little bit. There were so many things I had to learn out of necessity, and that's what built this project. And soon after, she would release her next single, My Kink is Karma, written with Dan Nigro and Justin Tranter, which is a revenge fantasy song singing about taking pleasure in her ex's downfall. This song would have a fully costumed and choreographed music video. When talking about this song, Chapel would say, I've been through some pretty gnarly breakups and I was sitting in a session and I was like, ah, it feels so nice that my ex is doing horrible, which is insanely toxic. The song is toxic. I'm very aware that it's not healthy, but that's how I was feeling that day. The only reason the song was possible was because my friends believed in me enough to help me. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. I feel so loved. This song is very bitter and toxic, but I'm glad to be in a better place now. Thank you for waiting. I would not have been able to do this without my best friends working their asses off for free. I cannot process how loved and grateful I feel. I cannot thank you enough. This is so effing hard to do. This is my first full music video as an independent artist. I funded this with my money I've saved over the years. We've worked on this for weeks and I couldn't be happier with it. Thank you to my friends for believing in me and making my dreams come true. I love each of you deeply. Around this time, Chapel would also announce her first headline show in LA. And in May, after the release of My Kink is Karma, she would open up about her mental health on social media. She would say, I'm diagnosed with bipolar 2, and it's pretty hard to keep it together and release these songs. I've been on meds, and I was in full swing hypomania when Naked in Manhattan released, which I'm out of now. In the weeks leading up to and through My Kink is Karma release campaign, I've been in intensive outpatient therapy slash individual therapy four days a week, and it's definitely difficult to balance promoting and being consistently active on social media. 
I don't talk about it too much, but it affects me daily and it's a pretty big part of my music. I'm in a healthy spot, just want to share, and I think it's important to talk about mental health. At the end of May, she would have her first headline show at The Resident in Los Angeles, and the following day, she would open for Olivia Rodrigo on her final stop of the Sour Tour in San Francisco. I'm opening for Olivia Rodrigo! Do you see my name? Oh my god. <laughs> I literally just found this out like yesterday. This is like such a dream come true. It's in San Francisco on May 27th. Olivia, I love you. I'm playing new songs, Pink Pony Club obviously, and then Naked in Manhattan. It's a 40 minute set, bitch. So, la la. I'm so excited. Before her first headline show, she would say, My first full show in four years. I am floating. We put blood, sweat, and tears into this project, and tonight she comes alive. I highly encourage audience members to dress full out, do drag, gowns, glitter, thongs, whatever makes you feel like a pink pony girl. For those of you who couldn't get tickets, there will be many, many more to come, I promise. After her first headline show, she would say, I am in the car on my way to San Francisco to open for Olivia Rodrigo tonight, still buzzing from last night's show and drinking my Baja Blast. Can't really use my brain right now to make an emotional post, but I feel so loved. Last night made seven years of pushing through this industry worth it. Thank you so much, and I can't wait for more shows. And after her first headline show and opening for Olivia Rodrigo, all of her and her friends' efforts would finally be rewarded and pay off. After releasing singles independently and doing self-funded music videos and DIYing all of the costumes and makeup, the following year, when she would look back at her first headline show, she would say it was a very confirming experience for her, saying, For all of the years I felt so lost and so insecure, for the years that I was wondering if I was in the right industry, if I should be a singer at all, and if I was making music that meant something to me, at that moment, all of this was confirmed. The answer to my questions was yes. It was a small location, there were maybe 400 people. In New York, I played in front of 600 people and I couldn't believe it. There's nothing in the world I could want more than to be on stage. And at these shows, Chapel would perform quite a few of her unreleased songs, like After Midnight, Coffee, Kaleidoscope, and Casual. She would also perform a cover of You Oughta Know by Alanis Morissette, and she would sing one of her pre-Pink Pony Club songs, Bitter. And in June, Chapel and Verite would be announced as openers for Fletcher's Girl of My Dreams tour, happening in late 2022. And Chapel would also announce two more headline shows, one in LA at the Troubadour and one in New York at the Bowery Ballroom, both around 500 seat venues. But both of these shows would sell out in the first 24 hours, and she would also announce different costume themes for her show, Pink Pony Club and My Kink is Karma. And this would become a tradition at Chapel shows going forward. For the My Kink is Karma show in New York, she would say, full drag and assless chaps are encouraged. The theme is My Kink is Karma, dress up sexy AF in your devil or clown drag. Red glitter outfits, rainbow rhinestones, ultra glam, I'll be in my drag as well. And soon she would start teasing her next single on social media, which she had already been performing live, Feminanomenon. And Feminanomenon is an eclectic sound singing about female pleasure, combining the words feminine and phenomenon. In a Reddit AMA, she would be asked what the inspiration behind the song would be, and she would reply, Um, no man could literally get me off. Still the case. And my co-writer and I were just messing around and we made up the word. Haha, <laughs> it's so weird. And when Chapel would release her debut album, this song would end up being the opening track. And Chapel felt like it was a good introduction to her music because it's like three songs in one. And if you enjoyed this song, you'll enjoy the album. Upon the release, she would write on Instagram, I wanted something you can effing move and scream and party to. I think we accomplished that, hee hee. I'm so proud of how this vision came together and it sinks to my friends. It's literally a dream come true. This song pushed me out of my comfort zone for sure. Thank you, Dan Nigro, for creating this with me. Ladies, you know what I mean? And you know what you need? And so does he! But does it happen? No! But does it happen? No! But what we really need is a... Phenomenon! A what? A phenomenon! Hit it like, hit it like, like one pom 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 Get it hot, get it hot like Papa John. And for the single cover, she would be wearing a bedazzled biker outfit and do a photo shoot on a pink bike in a field. She would say, 
thank you to my parents for letting us stay at their house in Missouri, feeding us and letting us ride around in their backyard. And of course, decorating the dirt bike. For her first two shows in LA, Chapel Run would have Devin again open for her. But for her NYC show, she would look for local drag queens to open for her. She would be inspired by Orville Peck's 2018 show at the Troubadour in West Hollywood. And she told herself that whenever she got a headline tour, she'd have drag queens as openers. And this would become a tradition on all of Chapel's tours. When talking about why she does this, she would say, The queer community is my main fan base, so it's my responsibility to pay it forward by donating a portion of ticket sales in general to LGBTQ plus charities and show up at Pride events. I'm here to give back all the energy that the queer community has given to me. And she would say, many people don't even know that there are drag queens in their city. My performances provide a platform for the queens to get their names out there and network with their community. And I just love seeing different drag queens every night, all over the world, Paris, Melbourne, Berlin, just everywhere. It's great to see that drag is a huge family all over the world. I think it's important to integrate them into a show. No one does a better show than a drag queen. And Chapel's continued tradition of having drag queens open for her is very important, especially in a time in America where being a drag performer is, in some states, possibly becoming illegal. And it's very important that Chapel's able to support the drag queens and also show people that drag isn't a problem and it's something positive and a creative art. Also, in September of 2022, Chapel would open for a single stop on the Tony, Grammy, and Emmy award-winning singer Ben Platt's tour, and she would debut a new blue dress. I loved looking up TikToks for this, and people would post like, wait, I randomly saw Chapel at an opening for Ben Platt or Olivia Rodrigo years ago, and I didn't know who she was. Chapel would start to promote another single, On social media, Casual, explaining that the song is written about her pure disdain for casual relationships. And she would have a feature on Rolling Stone in October, calling her a thrift store pop princess. And Casual would start to become popular on TikTok before the song had even been released. It became a bit of a meme that Casual was a Taylor Swift song because people thought she sounded like Taylor Swift in the song, I guess. Casual would be written with Dan Nigro and Morgan St. Jean, and she would explain that this song was inspired by a long-distance relationship she had when she was working at the drive through coffee kiosk, and she met someone online who was very vulnerable and important to her. And when they finally met in person, Chapel experienced things that she never had before with this person, and a week later, they said they had met someone else. You said we're not together. And she heard that that person described their relationship as casual to one of Chapel's friends behind her back. And she was blindsided by this because she thought they were building a real relationship and she didn't think it was casual at all. In this interview, she'd also reveal that their relationship never progressed past kissing. And this song was mainly inspired by that experience, but also brought in other life experiences as inspiration. Somewhat contrasting to the song's vulgar lyrics describing sexual acts that they are engaging in. Also, an important reminder that things that happen in songs that people are singing about are not 100% biographical to their real lives, and experiences become ideas that evolve and change during the writing process. When releasing this song in October on social media, Chapel would write, I get pissed every time I sing this song. I think most of you can relate to that feeling of thinking a relationship is deeper than it really is. This song is for the heartbroken and angry ponies. I can't wait to hear you scream this with me on tour with Fletcher next week. She would also say, I needed to write a song about a common situationship within queer relationships, where someone is struggling to come to terms with themselves. It's a song about wishing well to someone who is avoidant of their true feelings. And this song would become a anti-situationship anthem, And it would get lots of attraction from media outlets and social media, and it would be featured on the Spotify playlist Lorem with Chapel as the cover, which is a popular Spotify playlist highlighting Gen Z artists. And while opening for Fletcher in November of 2022, Chapel's average set list would be Naked in Manhattan, After Midnight, You Oughta Know, Feminine Nominon, My Kink is Karma, Casual, and Pink Pony Club. In November, Chapel would also announce 
the dates of her headline tour, the Naked in North America tour, featuring 20 stops, and $1 for every ticket sold would be donated to the charity for the girls, a black trans-led collective that supports black transgender people, and she would also announce that she's searching for local drag queens to open up each stop of her tour, and she would explain that it's just a great way to engage the local queer community in that city. I encourage people to tip the queens. That's redistributing funds within the community there. It also it just gives a platform for drag queens. Some of the queens have never performed in front of a crowd that big before, and it's just fun. And in January of 2023, she would post on Instagram that she has finished writing the final song for her album, and she could just explode with excitement. And she would announce the different themes for each stop on her Naked in North America tour and encourage people to dress up and post inspiration boards for each theme. And Chapel would say, I love the queer community. When queer people are together, it's the happiest, most vibrant feeling. The shows are a way for me to give a safe space for queer people to have fun and dress up. It feels like magic on stage. I'm literally getting teary-eyed because it's everything I ever wanted. The Naked in North America tour would happen in February and March of 2023, and the set list would include Naked in Manhattan, Love Me Anyway, Feminine Omenon, After Midnight, Coffee, Bitter, Red Wine Supernova, You Oughta Know, The Alanis Morissette Cover, Hot To Go, Kaleidoscope, My Kink Is Karma, and Casual with an encore of California and Pink Pony Club. During the Naked in North America tour, Chapel's costuming would also really flourish, and she would have a lot of amazing themes for her show, like Rainbows and Rhinestones, Dragon Disco, My Kink is Karma, Homecoming Queen, So You Want to Be a Pop Star, Goth Grunge and Glitter, Pink Pony Club. I'll try to find as many of the different looks from the different shows as I can, because I think they're all so great. For the So You Want to Be a Pop Star show, she would pay homage to Miley Cyrus and Hannah Montana, and she would write an Instagram post dedicated to Miley Cyrus saying, The best of both worlds. I saw Miley Cyrus with the Jonas Brothers opening in Kansas City in fourth grade. It was my first concert. I cried when Hannah walked out. I'm inspired by Hannah Montana. Her outfits, music, bubbly shows, all of it. I honor my younger self by becoming the person I wished to be when I was little. A shy, self-loathing girl from the Midwest who is deeply depressed. It took 10 years to become healthy, stable, loving, happily single woman. This tour has confirmed that patience is key with my career, but more importantly with myself. Thank you for being part of Little Chapel's dream come true. And soon she would start teasing the release of another song, Kaleidoscope, which she had already been singing on her tour. This song would be her only song on her debut album that was written solo. About it, she would say, a song about falling in love with someone for the first time and it being your best friend. The Naked in North America tour just ended and I'm still coming down to be honest. Too emotional to write a proper caption, this is my favorite song I've ever written. This song is called Kaleidoscope and it comes out at the end of March. And it's very special, it's very, very special to me because it's about the first time I fell in love. And you know, sometimes you fall in love with your best friend and you know what else happens? It doesn't work out. If I sing this song and I hear people talking, it makes me feel really bad about myself. I not even want to play it on tour because it's so hard for me to get through. So if I sing it, I just want to make sure, even if you don't like it, it's okay. But at least you listen. Here we go again. Everything is fine. And in April, Chapel would announce her single show for her Naked in London stop of the tour at The Garage. She'd announce the dates for her next tour, the Midwest Princess Tour, for fall of 2023. She'd announce her next song, Red Wine Supernova, which she had already been performing on her tours. About Red Wine Supernova, Chapel would say, I needed a campy gay girl song that captured the magic of having feelings for another girl. I packed this song with fun raunchy lyrics that makes it feel like a night out flirting with the girl across the bar. And it would be written at a time before she had expressed her feelings for women openly. She would say, it's kind of an imposter syndrome that because I've dated men in the past, it doesn't make me as queer as someone who's only dated queer people. 
Sometimes that scares me, but my project only affirms who I am. And Chapel would be pretty open in future interviews that she doesn't date men anymore. She would say, I'm never dating a man again. She put up bluntly. <laughs> I'm not attracted to them. I don't like having sex with them. I don't think they understand me, and I don't think they make good art. This song would be written with Dan Nigro, Lisa Hickox, Amy Cuny, and Annie Schindel. This song would go through many iterations. Chapel would show off a demo version of Redwine Supernova on a TikTok Live. So not like it's pretty, but it just wasn't right. It was also completely different. Completely different lyrics. This song has been rewritten. Yeah. Bloodshot, heavy eyes. You just got a pocket knife. Carving initials. You talk slick. And say how you feel. And it's making me sick. And in the hallway, waiting for ya. Mini skirt and my go go boots. I just want you to. Just wait. You're straight era. Period. <laughs> Ready? I'm gonna skip to the chorus. It's so boring. <laughs> Another version of Red Wine Supernova would leak. Touch like Madonna for the very first time. In the hallway, waiting for ya. Many skirt and platform shoes. On June 12th of 2023, she would perform in London for her Naked in London show. She'd be told by the drag queen Crayola, who was opening for her, that she is also a drag queen, and this was a big breakthrough in her realizing that Chapel Roan is her drag persona. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm like you. I, I need to get my makeup and my clothes on and kind of transform them. And she was like, honey, you are a drag queen. You're not just getting makeup on, you're a drag queen. And I was like, oh my God. Like that was very altering. Like that, there was something that switched over the summer when I did that in June. I really have taken that on as an identity, and it's been very freeing to be like, oh, Chapel Roan is a drag, is my drag project. And I think that's also helped personally to separate it as like a project, and then there's me as Kaylee. When talking about her drag persona, she would say, I really embody my inner child who loves sparkles, who loves costume jewelry and big makeup. In another interview, she would say, I have such a difficult time as Kaylee with sex. I have a hard time watching sex scenes or flirting with people. I get really uncomfortable with hypersexual things. But as the drag queen that I play, Chapel, she's not like that. She is very confident and comfortable singing about those things. And in August, Chapel would start teasing another single, Hot To Go, which would be her last single before her album release. She would say, truly just wrote this song to have fun on stage. I wanted to make a cheer so we could dance together. The video is out on YouTube now too. Thank you to everyone who worked on this song and video. So this one is called Hot To Go and I'll teach you the dance. H-O-T-T-O-G-O. -T -T you can take me hot to go. H-O-T-T-O-G-O. -T -T you can take me hot to go. All right, ready? Five, six, five, six, seven, eight. Around this time, she would also announce the track list for her album, which would include all of the singles that she's released between Pink Pony Club and them, with the exception of Love Me Anyway. In September, Olivia Rodrigo would announce her Guts tour, and Chapel would be opening for the first 20 stops of the tour. And because Chapel Roan and Olivia Rodrigo share a producer, Dan Nigro, Chapel has actually recorded background vocals on some of Olivia Rodrigo's songs, like Lacey, Obsessed, and Can't Catch Me Now. Chapel would also announce the stops of her Midwest Princess tour in Australia and Europe for December and November. And on September 22nd of 2023, The Rise and Fall of a Midwest Princess would be released, and Chapel would write a long, heartfelt post celebrating the release of the album and talking about all the singles that pushed her career forward in the past four years and got her where she is today. 
She would write, no eyebrows but full of dreams. Each single slowly pushed me forward the past four years to where we finally are today. The Rise and Fall of a Midwest Princess, my very first album, comes out tonight. Pink Pony Club, released in the worst time in history and was terrified that people wouldn't get it. Little did I know, I was the one who didn't get it. Because it was absolutely the right song to release and birthed a new me. California, released shortly before I was dropped by a major label. Heartbroken in so many ways, but it was all meant to be. Naked in Manhattan. After two years of silence and struggling to make ends meet with random part-time jobs, this song propelled me into a new era of trashy glam and queer freedom. My kink is karma. Many of you don't know this, but I was actually in outpatient therapy for hypomanic suicide ideation during the entire campaign for this song and video and still somehow pulled it off. It's my favorite music vid I have ever done. Feminomenon. A bitch to pronounce, but a bad bitch was born. A song that forced me into being bold whether I liked it or not. Casual. A song I had no expectations for, but damn was I wrong. In the person who I was infatuated with, thank you to boiling down our relationship to a single word, casual. You were right. Kaleidoscope. This captures every feeling I had of falling in love with someone I adored as a best friend and more. And I am most proud of this one on the album because it proves that yes, I can write a song that I like by myself. Redwine Supernova. Written shortly after Pink Pony Club and Naked in Manhattan in 2019 and a long journey of constantly being trashed and revived then trashed again but at the end of the day singing this song live is one of my faves hot to go i was very self-conscious to release this because i thought it made me less of a writer to write a song that really had nothing to do with anything other than having fun and being hot because i realized it's actually harder for me to make great fun songs than great sad songs and hot to go is a great song imo the songs cover art slash videos slash everything were done by a large team of friends and collaborators and upon the release of the album on Instagram, she would write, Today is the seventh anniversary of my grandpa Chapel's passing. It was not planned to come out this day, but with the series of moving the release date over and over, we somehow ended up here. I see it as my grandpa blessing me, and I believe he is with me today. Writing this with tears when I say thank you from the bottom of my heart for sticking with me for the past decade, it has taken for this to come to fruition. This was possible because of the dedicated hard work of my friends, family, and my entire team. Thank you for years of working for free, pulling favors, taking risks, and tirelessly believing in this. It is because of you that we made it. This album is for the 10-year-old girl from the Midwest who has never thought she could be herself. The girl who felt shame from the day she turned 13 for having a deeper love for her girl best friend that was unlike anything she felt for boys. For the girl who is told to be proper and sweet and ladylike, but simply never would be. I hope you feel freedom and joy when you listen to this. I hope it gives you solace in difficult times. My dream has already come true because I have seen the joy this music has created out of thin air. That's all I can ask for. I'm so proud of myself for daring to fail, and against all obstacles, succeeded. We did it. XOXO Chapel. This album would be released under Island Records and Amusement Records, Dan Nigro would actually create his own record label, with Chapel Roan being the only performer signed to it. Dan Nigro would write on his Instagram, I never had any intention of starting a record label, but after Chapel Roan was dropped from her deal in 2021, we, Chapel and I, decided to go at it alone and start releasing music and funding the project ourselves. It has been one of the most rewarding and exciting experiences of my life. Helping decide what songs to release, when to release them, when the songs feel like they are finished, how many bridges or guitar solos should we have. I love it with every part of me. So with quite a bit of help from Island Records, we are making it official. Here's to a new chapter. And after releasing the album, Chapel would say, I feel really at peace, which is something I didn't really know I would feel. But I just feel gratitude and peace. I'm so proud that I kept going through all the part-time jobs, through being dropped by a label, through all the breakups, through all the times my bank account was nearly empty, I think as long as I'm literally putting on shows that make people happy or playing music that makes people feel seen and heard, I couldn't ask for anything else. So this album would include all of her singles along with five additional songs, creating a track list of 14 songs. The additional songs would be After Midnight, which was written with Dan Nigro and Casey Smith. About this song, Chapel would say, once I moved to LA when I was 18, I just realized that literally everything good happens after midnight like it is a blast. And a lot of what I was taught was out of fear for what's more dangerous, which I totally get. But I was just so baffled that at 3 a.m., it is so fun. It's just a little saying that my dad said he's not really adamant about that. He was just like, 
what's a bubbly pop song that we can just talk about party? The album would also include Coffee, which Chapel has been playing live since 2022. She was inspired to write the song when she went to film her Naked in Manhattan music video in New York, and it happened to be that her ex lived there at the time, and they wanted to meet up platonically. So rather than going out to a bar or something, she decided that they should just have a casual coffee date. And this song was about how she hoped that they could stay platonic but it didn't end up going that way but this is how she wished it would have happened I'll meet you for a coffee cause if we have wine you'll say that you want me I know that's a lie and if I didn't love you it would be fine so meet me for a coffee only for a coffee no And this song was written with Dan Nigro, Maya Kirchin, and Eric Leva. And the next song on the album, Super Graphic Ultra Modern Girl, written by Dan Nigro, Annika Bennett, and Jonah Shai, would be a song about her singing about how she's over dating boys and wants to find a girl similar to herself who is super graphic and ultra modern. She would be inspired by interior design for the words super graphic and ultra modern that were used to describe a house. And she kept those in her back pocket and remembered them for a writing session. And Picture You, co-written with Dan Nigro, is a song that starts with an illustration of Chapel being with a lover only to reveal that she's alone and longing for someone. She fears that her feelings are unrequited, but she desperately wants to know how the other person feels about her and if they feel the same way. Chapel Run would say, That song is directly related to Casual. And you can see how Picture You was how I wanted them to see me so badly and I was obsessed over them. And it turned out to be just casual for them. And that's why it was so shocking to me because I pictured them in so many different ways. So I think Picture You is a somber song as well as a kind of sexy song. Draw the blinds, light every candle, slip off my pretty dress. Down my chest when I think of you every night, both lips on the mirror, twitch realistic, mountain lipstick, stains where you should be. And finally, the last song in the album, Guilty Pleasures, written with. Dan Nigro, Marcus Anderson, and Nate Campany. Chapel sings about forbidden desires and the excitement it can bring. What Chapel would say about this song is, it was my favorite song that I wrote because it's so weird and it's very me. The rise and fall of a Midwest princess would include a dedication to her grandfather in it saying, Dear Papa, I wish you could see what we created. I named this project after you to honor your name and your never ending love. Chapel being your last name, a name that brings me so many lovely memories. Roan references your favorite old Western song, The Strawberry Roan. You would have loved all of this. You would have loved the shows, the songs, the music videos, and the feeling of the crowd singing with me. You would have loved to see me succeed. I'm heartbroken that you're not here to experience this with me and the rest of the family. Thank you for believing in me forever. I'm here because of you. I think about you every day. I miss your jokes. 
I miss you. Love, Kaylee Rose. She would also include her thank yous in the album, saying, Thank you to my management team, Nick Bobsky, Ruby Anton, Maya McKinn Morrison, for all of your love and passion that have pulled me through every single day. Thank you, Daniel Nigro, for helping me bring the world of Chapel Road to life and pushing me to be a better writer, vocalist, performer, and person. Thank you for supporting me through all of this. Thank you for believing in me the whole time. Thank you to Ryan Clemens for your talent and gentleness throughout the years, resulting in the vision of this album that I thought could only exist in my dreams. You made my literal dreams come true. Thank you, Ramesha Sitar, for being the light of my life. You've designed the vinyl and graphics of my dreams for this project. I knew we were going to be best friends from the first hour we met. I've never felt so understood creatively, comedically, and as a fellow weird art girl. Thank you so much for your friendship and your brilliant mind. Thank you, Gia Rigoli, for your generosity and passion for this project. You've saved me so many times, and you are truly incredible. You've been with me through so much. It's funny at this point. Thank you to all my other lovely friends and family who have helped me bring this work to life. I'm forever grateful. Thank you, Island Records, for honoring my art in a way that honors me. I respect you and you respect me. I truly never thought I'd say this, but I love my major label. I am very grateful to be signed with you. Thank you, mom and dad, for being the best supportive parents a kid who wants to pursue a music career could ask for. You are my number one fans. I cannot explain how loved I feel. Thank you for being patient with me all of these years and loving me through my illness. I look up to both of you more than you know. I love you. To the queer community, may this album let you experience joy in whatever capacity that may be. I hope it reaches the girls in the Midwest, just like me, who are struggling to come to terms with their feelings. To myself, this is for you, the girl who desperately wanted to express herself this way since she was nine. Here is your excuse to dress however you want, show off your voice, dance the way you've dreamed of, create shows you've always wanted to attend, wear sparkly makeup, and feel the acceptance and joy you've always longed for. Here you go. Have fun, princess. The album would receive positive reviews with critics praising Chapel's songwriting, innovation, and unique style. So you may think all of this leading up to the release of The Rise and Fall of a Midwest Princess would be Chapel's Rise, but Chapel would stay a relatively small artist up until her album release. She would get a big boost in followers around the time of releasing My Kink is Karma, Hot to Go, up until the album release, and she would have around 150,000 followers on TikTok and Instagram, and she'd be having steady growth throughout releasing all of her singles. But it wouldn't be until after her album release that her career would start to gain more widespread attention. The first leg of the Midwest Princess Tour, she'd be performing at 700 to 2,000 capacity venues, about the size of the artists that she was opening for at the beginning of her career. In October through November, she would do the first leg of the Midwest Princess Tour with lots of great diverse looks and themes for the shows. She would write on Instagram, Every show I have a theme that is inspired by a song off of the album. It is highly encouraged to dress up. Do not worry, you will not be alone. Hee <laughs> hee. I love seeing people's outfits. It's so cute and it allows the show to not only be on stage, but also in the audience with all of you. I really encourage people to dress up because it's so fun to see others in costume too. Go full out. I want to see makeup beat, outfits serving, see wig snatched, turn out. I promise you won't be the only one. Be who you are. And my favorite new theme that you'd introduce for the Midwest Princess Tour is Angels and Devils because you'd have these great angel wing looks. And for her Halloween show, she would be Regina George in her Halloween costume in Mean Girls. And whoa, I also have a Mean Girls deep dive if you want to check that out. Thanks. Her set list during this tour would include every song off of her album, along with a cover of Lady Gaga's Bad Romance. In late 2023, she would get more promotional opportunities, and many publications and channels saw that she was on the cusp of a big rise in popularity. For example, she'd be featured as Vivo's artist to watch in 2024. And Rolling Stone would name The Rise and Fall of a Midwest Princess one of the top 100 albums of the year, and Red Wine Supernova one of the top 100 songs of the year. After finishing the Oceania and European leg of the Midwest Princess Tour, Chapel would reflect on how far she's come in December. 
writing on social media. Touring these past three months have taught me that this is exactly what I was meant to do. All of the years and tears leading up to this were worth it. How lucky am I to dance and dress up clothes and sing pop music I love and I'm proud of. Thank God for the team of hardworking, lovely people I get to work with. So proud of everyone. When I was 15 and I was told it would take 10 plus years to get where I wanted in my career, I rolled my eyes so hard. But here we are, bitch. A decade later and we're still on our bullshit and I couldn't be happier. I'm only here because of the love and support of my community. This year was made possible by friends, family, an entire team of people who believed in me. What an incredible ride it's been, and we're only getting started. Yay! In January, the music video for Casual would be selected for South by Southwest Film Festival, and in January, she would announce more dates of the Midwest Princess Tour, including multiple music festivals like Boston Calling, Austin City Limits, the Governor's Ball Music Festival, Bonnaroo Music Festival, Lollapalooza, and Coachella for April, May, and June after her Olivia Rodrigo tour engagement. Early on in Chapel's career, she said that she would love to play music festivals. Really hoping I get to, to go do like festival tours, like just like it's summertime and there's festivals yeah. and I've never done that. So I really hope I get to do that. Okay, yeah. yeah. And while on tour for Olivia Rodrigo, she would make her late night debut playing Red Wine Supernova on the Colbert Late Show. And Chapel would be picked as MTV's push artist for March and perform Red Wine Supernova and Pink Pony Club for them. And she would also perform a set on NPR's Tiny Desk. While performing with Olivia Rodrigo, her opening set list would be Feminanomenon, Naked in Manhattan, After Midnight, Super Graphic Ultra Modern Girl, Hot to Go, Casual, Red Wine Supernova, My Kink is Karma, and Pink Pony Club. And opening for Olivia Rodrigo was a great opportunity for Chapel to reach a new audience and for Olivia and Chapel to mix audiences as they do have a similar aesthetic and obviously they both work with Dan Nigro. And she would also do some solo shows in between the stops of Olivia Rodrigo's tour. And after finishing her engagement on the Guts tour, she would continue the Midwest Princess tour in April. Her new set list would include the return of Love Me Anyway and a new song, Good Luck Babe. And Good Luck Babe would be written with the Dream Team, Justin Trander and Jan Nigro. And the song is about compulsive heterosexuality and how Chapel's dealt with it in past relationships when she's dealing with the girl who's denying feelings for other girls. And after playing Good Luck Babe at a couple shows, she would release it on April 5th, saying... We're entering a new chapter of the project and I'm exploring it right along with you. The way I look at it, I'm going to continue to write songs I love and putting them out. Thank you for all your love. This is so special. And because Chapel's career was blowing up around this time, the release of Good Luck Babe would be her first song to debut on the Billboard Hot 100 at number 77, and it would continue to chart, peaking at number 10. The rise and fall of a Midwest princess would also enter the charts. And soon after, Hot To Go, Red Wine Supernova, Pink Pony Club, and Casual would also enter the Billboard Hot 100. Some were surprised that she would want to move on from the Midwest Princess and start a new chapter so soon. But as you know from this video, the Midwest Princess era has been years in the making. So when she was asked if she'd make a deluxe version of the Midwest Princess album, she would say, I only want one. I don't want to deal with two versions. I was like, let's move on. We'll just put out a song that I love. That's how I did it last time. And when releasing Good Luck Babe, she would also start to tease a new single, Read and Make Out, which was released as a demo on the B-side of the Good Luck Babe vinyl. And after releasing Good Luck Babe, Chapel would perform at Coachella, and Coachella would have lots of viral moments for Chapel, with a lot of people online celebrating her costuming and makeup and performance. When you think about me, Right before Coachella is also when Sabrina Carpenter released Espresso, and similar to Chapel Roan, she had been building momentum since the release of her last album, and Espresso was her big breakthrough into the mainstream. Somewhat similar to Chapel Roan's story, rather than opening for Olivia Rodrigo, she opened for Taylor Swift on the Eras tour, 
and both of them have been praised for their stage presence and performance and having a very consistent and recognizable aesthetic. There's also been this big push about how fun, frivolous, flirty pop music needs to be back, and Chapel Roan and Sabrina Carpenter have become the face of that. After her viral butterfly look at Coachella and the Swan Lake look from Jimmy Fallon when she performed Good Luck Babe, Chapel was starting to have a pretty recognizable aesthetic. Even though she can vary the costuming and makeup a lot, the bright red curly hair and blue eyeshadow became kind of the staples of the Chapel Roan look. And she's continued to have amazing costuming, like the Lady Liberty costume at the Governor's Ball and the wrestler costume at Lollapalooza. According to Lollapalooza, Chapel Roan drew the biggest daytime crowd of all time. Sabrina Carpenter would also cover Good Luck Babe. And I think it's really great that rather than what could easily become a rivalry or competition between the two of them, has become supportive and respective of each other's artistry. And this is how we got to the summer of Chapel Roan. She had already had the building blocks and the singles and tours and looks and makeup. So when it was time for her breakthrough into the mainstream, the Chapel Run project was already fully realized. Initially, what drew people to Chapel's music was her raw storytelling. Even as far back as when she opened for Vance Joy and Declan McKenna, many reviewers commented on how great her stage presence was. And it's interesting to see that artists who are signed to labels so young are put in a box and expected to keep the same aesthetic that they had when they were like 15. But Chapel pushing back and wanting to have creative control over her music was important and it could have been detrimental to her musical career, but she was allowed to have creative freedom being an independent artist. And I think that was a blessing in disguise for her. I thought before making this video and doing research, Chapel Run's persona reinvention might have been kind of shocking or insincere, but I think you can actually see a lot of similarities to from school nights to now. It's not like the Chapel Roan, who she was before, was completely abandoned. She's always had bold makeup looks and strong aesthetic branding. She was very dedicated to the witchy gothic vibe and always had dramatic gestures on stage and always had intimate details about her romantic life in her songs. So from that aspect, I actually don't find her evolution of songwriting and branding that shocking. You can definitely see where it came from, from her older work to now. And she still pays respect to her younger self, occasionally singing some of her older pre-Pink Pony Club songs on stage. And she does this because she wants to honor her younger self and she knows how happy her younger self would be to play these songs for such a big crowd. Yeah, I'm gonna stay And of course, she wouldn't have been able to build her initial fan base without her TikTok, where she was able to be silly and outspoken and fun in a way I don't think you would have seen if she was signed to a major label who wanted her to have a more manicured image. I think this authenticity is really important to her image, and it's definitely harder as artists become bigger for them to keep the authenticity they had when they were smaller, but it's just kind of the natural progression of becoming more famous. You can't be as open about stuff as you are in your early career. I mean, we even saw this with, in my Taylor Swift deep dive video, Taylor Swift used to make these long MySpace blog posts about her shows, and now she does make short Instagram captions, but she even has the comments turned off on them, like she can't be as present with her fans as she used to. And I think similarly, Chapel will have to do the same. But I didn't realize until making this video how hard Chapel worked on her TikToks and how much work she really put into it. Especially, I don't know if she had an editor, but she made so many TikToks to promote her songs and she did so many makeup and costume looks. And I know that was a lot of work. I wanted to include a lot of her different TikToks because I was just so impressed with how much work she put into them. At the time when she was putting these out, she was getting like somewhat little return for how much work I feel like she was putting into them. So I was very impressed with her dedication and tenacity to continue to make music and try to promote herself as an independent artist, especially around 2022 when she was going at it completely alone. And it's interesting to see how Olivia Rodrigo and Chapel Roan's careers kind of go hand in hand because they've been working with the same producer, Dan Nigro. And I'm interested to see also about the rise of Conan Gray. Let me know if you have any other fun Chapel Roan facts that you want to share. And I hope you enjoyed this video. 
please consider liking and commenting and subscribing. Bye!